Good morning, everyone. I see, I see heads bobbing in the shadows in a far nether region called the back of the auditorium. If you, if you could so kindly, if you find yourself seated beneath the edge of the balcony, you may be a little far back. And, and if you would move up, we would be very appreciative. And the reason for that is that the Q&A system in place for the conference, which involves an app and iTunes and proprietary software, uh, and which has a backup plan B of note cards, it's not something that either Amanda or I, as, as poets, feel very um, confident of. We're a little suspicious. <laughs> and so what we would like to do is have the option, when we get to the Q&A part of the program, to allow you, with your own voice, to ask us a question, and for us to be able to look you in the eye and answer you. And in order to do that, um, our, our colleague here, uh, Caroline, will need to come to you with a microphone. And so for the benefit of Caroline, who will be running around this auditorium with that microphone, the closer you are, the better for poetry. Okay? Well, thank you all for coming. I'm very happy to see you. I'm honored to introduce this panel of the power of the words of women featuring the inaugural youth poet laureate, Amanda Gorman. As a longtime writer and teacher of writing, and as a longtime poet and the teacher of poets, I have to be honest with myself. Uh, I, I haven't thought much about the position of poet laureate in the United States, except, you know, when the reappointments are made. When the reappointments are made, we all get on the phone with one another. <laughs> and so it's of great interest to me, this new position, youth poet laureate. So I went looking for some facts to give me context. And those facts have to do with the position of poet laureate of the United States to begin with. And I have to also concede that I perhaps did not appreciate greatly enough that we have a poet laureate, a youth poet laureate, that we have poet laureates of states in this country and as much as I have in the last few years. And I am starting to understand the world of the arts and the world of the humanities, a world in which I've lived for my entire adult life, to be a privilege uh, that is much out of reach for many. Some facts about the Poet Laureate of the United States. Um, who after 1985 is now officially called the Poet Laureate Consultant. The Poet Laureate of the United States is appointed by the Librarian of the United States Con Congress and serves from October to May. Uh, the Librarian consults with current and former laureates and other distinguished personalities in the field. Not me, they haven't, they haven't asked me about it yet. The laureate presents an annual lecture and reading of his or her poetry and usually introduces poets at the library's poetry series. Collectively, the laureates have brought more than 2,000 poets and authors to the library to read for the archive of recorded poetry and literature. Poet laureates who some of you might recognize might be Robert Penn Warren, Robert Lowell, Elizabeth Bishop, Conrad Aiken, William Carlos Williams, Robert Frost, who is sitting right now as I speak in front of Old Main, frozen in a bronze pose gazing across the quad, 
Gwendolyn Brooks, Rita Dove, and Louise Gluck. And it is probably not a coincidence that the first, first poet laureate who was really on my radar was Rita Dove because I was an undergraduate walking around campus with Rita Dove books tucked under each arm. And this, for me, was the miracle that would set the stage for my life. And that's the hopefulness of being an undergraduate. I've been lucky enough in my career to count two recent poet laureates as close colleagues, uh, Natasha Trethewey and Tracy K. Smith. When I look at photos of Amanda Gorman, I imagine that when I met Tracy K. Smith one June summer night in Pittsburgh while she was dancing barefoot in a room with a lot of other wonderful black poets, that she was not much older, if at all, than Amanda is now. Each consultant has brought a different perspective and mission to the position. I read somewhere that Rita Dove is considered the first activist poet laureate brought together, uh, that brought together a lot of initiatives that had to do with the African diaspora. And I immediately think when I read something that they might have forgotten about Gwendolyn Brooks. As I've learned more about the poet laureates of the United States, it helps me understand more the great necessity for a youth poet laureate the Youth Poet Laureate Program is an initiative of Urban World, an award-winning youth literary arts and youth development organization in collaboration with local youth literary arts organizations across the country, which is supported by the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities, which we should all hope will continue to exist. The Library of Congress, the Academy of American Poets, the Poetry Society of America, Penn Center USA, and my own poetry home, Cave Canem, a fellowship for black poets founded by the poets Toy Derricotte and Cornelius Eady. And for those of you who've seen this written somewhere, Cave, it's not Cave Canem, it's Cave Canem after the Latin, beware of the dog. In 2008, Urban World launched the nation's first ever Youth Poet Laureate program, since then, Urban World has honored nine youth poet laureates in New York City, each having released their own debut collections of poetry from penmanship books. In 2014, Urban World partnered with six of the top youth literary organizations in Los Angeles to launch the first ever LA Youth Poet Laureate Program and announced the inaugural Los Angeles Youth Poet Laureate. Since then, Urban World has launched youth poet laureate programs in 41 more cities across the country and counting. In September of 2016, Michelle Obama celebra celebrated the program at the White House and honored the inaugural group of finalists for the country's first ever National Youth Poet Laureate. In April of 2017, Urban World and its supporting partner organizations named the inaugural Youth Poet Laureate as Amanda Gorman. Amanda and the program were invited to the U.S. Poet Laureate Tracy K. Smith's opening reading at the Library of Congress. And the thought of the two of them standing together, since I have not seen an image, warms me to my toes. As I've read Amanda's poetry and watched her tape performances, I felt a small fire ignite in me that has been maybe dampened for a little while. My poetry is alive, but I concede it's been wrenched through a process of professionalization. It is part of my job. In Amanda's language, I hear hope calling out like an old friend, like a reminder of exactly what it was that brought me here in the first place. I'm delighted for you to have the opportunity to share in that hope on this stage today. Just a little bit about Amanda. Amanda Gorman is 19 years old. I believe she may still be 19 years old. And if I'm wrong about that, Amanda, I'm very sorry. Um, she is an ambassador for the online platform for teen girls, uh, scoofadoodle.com. 
an award-winning writer. She's founder and executive director of the organization One Pen, One Page, which promotes literacy among youth through creative writing programming, and online magazine advocacy initiatives. She has been a, her a Herald Fellow in Washington, D.C., a Her Lead Global Delegate in London at the Trust Women Conference, and a United Nations Youth Delegate to the United Nations Headquarters in NYC. NYC. And she has homework. <laughs> um, as a, a student at Harvard University, uh, with the, the weight of our future on her shoulders, she has still found the time to bring something beautiful into the world. And so please give her your thanks with your applause as she takes the stage. Thank you. Thank you. I give hugs. Thanks. Wow. Is this working? Hello? Testing, testing. Can you all hear me? Cool. Because everyone's in the back so far away. It's like a moon in the distance. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for that eloquent, poetic, marvelous introduction. Um, it's kind of was touched upon. My name is Amanda Gorman. I'm actually 20 now. Uh, um, yes, okay, so there's that. Um, to give you a bit of background about me, I'm from Los Angeles, California, which means currently I am very cold. I'm very out of breath, and I don't know why, and then I realized Altitude. Um, basically, I am from LA and I go to school in Boston. And around a year ago, I was named the first ever Youth Poet Laureate of the United States. Um, and it's kind of like, what does that mean? Um, I remember my roommates at college heard that and they thought like I was the Lorax or something from like Dr. Seuss. They were like, oh, so she speaks for the trees that cannot speak. And I was like, yes. <laughs> But no, um, to give you a bit of a kind of holistic view of what that means, that basically means that I serve as an ambassador to literacy, to youth, to poetry on a national level for the United States. So what that can look like is, um, like was mentioned, I helped introduce Tracy K. Smith, who's an amazing adult poet laureate, basically, of the United States. Look her up if you don't know her. Um, I got to introduce her at the Library of Congress. It means I get to speak about poetry and civic action on MTV or perform at the United Nations Social Good Summit. It means I get to speak at events like this and travel around the country, speaking to young people, to educators, to administrators, really trying to build up a conversation around what poetry and youth is like for young Americans today. Um, and then I also have homework, which is so true. I'm trying not to think about the essay I have due this weekend. Hey. Um, so that's a bit about me. Um, I also want to like start with a bit of ground rules before I begin. Not rules. Suggestions, openings. Um, who's been to a poetry reading before? Oh my gosh! Wow, there's a lot. Usually it's like, you know, two people in the front. They're like all apologetic about it. You guys are like, hey. Um, so for you who have not, and this might be your first time, second time, whatever, congratulations. Um, you might kind of know vaguely about snapping at Poetry Slams, anybody, or maybe not, yes, not, yes, okay, I see, yes, I see you right there, okay. Basically, if I'm reading a poem and you hear a line that you like or I'm saying something that really resonates with you, you can snap to let me know that you like what I'm saying. And that really helps me because when I continue my performance, when I'm reading poetry, it lets me know what the audience is really vibing with, what you guys need spiritually. Um, if you can't snap, which I cannot because I have the fingers of a twig. Um, you can also make what I call like the dark chocolate sound, which is like, mm. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> It's like you're in church. So any, choose anyone, but it's really useful to me as a poet and as a performer. So are you guys ready for some poetry? Okay, then we can get a little more. Are you guys ready for some poetry? Yes, nice, okay. I'm like, I'm out of breath, I'm cold, we can do it together. Okay, I'm gonna start with a poem about where I'm from, which I said is Los Angeles, California, and talking about that influence on me as a black woman. It's called Daughter's Metro Map to City Identity. 
On Slauson Avenue, I straddle black girls' tango between Northern Heights and South Hair Salon's home. Here I am diamond, solitary treasure on Western Avenue. I am unclaimed Christian scribbling homilies on the spines of Winkle Church fans. Here I am veteran, clutching cement scar. I am banded sticking to sidewalk. I am hymnal of homeless, homebound, impoverished, and important. Writing a city memory, the blood vessel sidewalks pumping my lungs until I mold existing, included, unforgettable. Was that one? Okay, I see some snaps. Um, you can feel free to snap during the poem as well. <laughs> because when I hear silence as a poem, I'm like, oh, wow. They don't like this at all. Um, so there's that one. Really the theme for today is talking about the power words and talking about the power words in terms of women, which is something that is very close to my heart. Um, I do a lot of work, kind of what was mentioned in my bio, advocating for girls' education, advocating for women's rights and access to literacy programs and things like that around the world. Um, but also, I think like the power words can be powerful for men too and non-binary people. Like it's whoever you are, words are amazing. Um, let's see. I'm trying to decide what you guys will like next because I wasn't feeling much electricity <laughs> in that other one. Um, oh. Here we go. I have like a mini Amanda library going on. Okay. So uh, anybody like Maya Angelou? All your hands, I should see everyone like, ah! if not, it's okay. My heart just broke a little bit if not. Um, but as a young writer, Maya Angelou is definitely an example of a woman whose words inspired me to share my voice and also listen to other people's. And this is a poem I wrote a long time ago. We're talking like high school, barely past puberty. I didn't even know like what poetry was. Um, and I wrote it the day that Maya Angelou died as a kind of like coda to her life. Um, a little teensy bit more backstory about me and why Maya Angelou is significant for me. As some of you might know, but Maya Angelou was sexually assaulted as a young woman, and that basically made her mute for a few years when she was growing up. And I, as a young girl growing up, I had a speech impediment and an auditory processing disorder, which didn't necessarily mean I was mute, it just meant that I kind of talked differently than other people. It was more difficult for me to communicate orally. It was a bit more difficult for me to understand when people were speaking to me face to face. And reading Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings changed my life because it was this moment where it was like, there is this woman who is like me and who found a voice, not necessarily in just speaking, but in poetry. And that was one of the most powerful moments. So this is called Linguistics Rising. From a young age, my lips learned the bittersweet honey of language. It's heavy, rich significance left thirsty from the letters that would gurgle from my mouth and dies too soon. I taught myself not to indulge in correct pronunciation, but in honeycombs of literature. The pale, yellowing pages of forgotten books, the dance ink and paper and bark on in a tango of penmanship, the forbidden and addictive romance between the pen and my fingertips at five. I saw power lapped up by sugar white cheeks and thin pink lips while I found solace in the ebony black blood of my pen against the cool flesh of my journal. Curiosity and bewilderment perspired on people's tongues when they heard me speak, moist with the question, where are you from? <laughs> like a cane, I bent to the expectation, saying that my mouth's odd choreography was from Africa or New York or the UK or <laughs> Ethiopia, <laughs> wherever they thought, muffling myself in cloaks of different assumed nationalities to clothe my limp letters was my diagnosis, and Maya Angelou was my medicine. When I thought I was an alien, abandoned here by my true relatives, my body stiff as a ruler, my figure thin as a sheet of math homework and letters that would die on my lips, he told me nothing that is human can be alien to me. I forget all of what she said, yet when people asked me to repeat words three times, she understood me. Just as she thought Shakespeare was a black girl, she knew how it felt to be a black girl in Los Angeles carrying a speech impediment in a book bag. Maya, I will not lay you to rest, I will lay you to rise in the climb of my tongue. Okay, you guys like
liked that one. Okay. Thank you. It's good. I, you guys are getting really well trained and advanced in the snaps. Like, this is like a class in how to be good poetry listeners. I think poetry reading is as much of a performance for me as it is for you, meaning that we're both engaged in this dialogue and this conversation. Never, I'm going off on like thesis writing here, never mind. But I think that dynamic is very interesting. On that topic, I kind of mentioned something funny, but also sadly true, which was when I was younger, I literally, I'm not lying, I literally thought I was an alien. I was like, I, I'm not from my family. <laughs> They are not like me. None of my family members are kind of like poets. My mom was like, you want to be a writer? Oh, you're going to live in my basement for all time. It was just like, <laughs> you're going to be poor, no. Um, and so I kind of felt just a little bit out of it um, growing up. I was like, I still am. <laughs> this really skinny, like small black girl. You know, I had this speech impediment. Um, you know, I talked weird. I looked weird. And I was like, obviously, like, I'm from Mars, that explains it. And so, and then my mom was like, let me clarify this <laughs> right now, because I went through too much trouble in my pregnancy with you and your twin for you to think you're from anywhere else but this. And I was like, okay, never mind. <laughs> We're all good. Um, so this poem is a kind of about that experience of trying to reconcile with the fact that I actually am human, <laughs> as we all are, and it's called Celestial. As a child, I soon discovered that stars are wise or vehement witnesses in a tribunal, nursing truths that they are too proud to reveal, constellated mouths flickering in a psalm of silence. I learned to give them my wishes, never my trust, my prayers, and never my faith, knowing I'd be swallowed by the civilly quiet of ungranted wishes. I was an alien, limbs too skinny for earthly evolution, hair dense with standing solar flares, thoughts floating among pulsing solar systems, consonants erupted, spangled shadows rings, a speck of dust, black skin matter, big bang. I explored the asteroid belts along my skin, and I scattered a five-pointed star engraved on my next tight guitar strings. I knew then I was more than dust of ages, particles of unseen. I was celestial. My limbs, thin streamers of light, a dancing sun, threading the very constellations, my very thoughts, my rich tears, nebulas exploding on night skin cheekbones. If I am celestial, if I am a star, my kin deems me the forgotten in a place so dark so that I could glow. Do 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 do. Let's see, Amanda, what do you want to do? I really do improvise the poems that I read. It's all about the energy that I feel from you guys. Do 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 do. Ooh, did I just make that noise? <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a poem that I actually wrote recently. Um, as was mentioned, I'm a Hurley Fellow, which is basically this organization that brings together like a cohort of young women from around the world, and we begin social justice projects. And it's also part of this amazing organization called Vital Voices. If you're a young woman, if you're a young girl, even if you're a man, whatever, look it up. I, I really suggest you would and see how you can get involved. And we were having this conversation about two weeks ago in DC about kind of the art of disruption. And we were bringing together women from all around the country who were all and who were using it for a purpose of positive social change in their communities. Um, and they were like, you know, how about you write a poem about that and perform? I was like, oh, but I have a Spanish essay due. <laughs> but I'll find time. And somehow I did. Um, and this is that poem that I read then. Um, yeah, cool. So let's do it. The Art of Disruption. From the start, being a woman has always been an art. The art of disruption, of resistance, an art of the most colorful persistence, a chase to outdistance that which insists on keeping us bound. The poets, the dancers, the painters, you can't restrain us down. And even if you did, the earth would just sing open with the sound. Or powers or older than the sage's pencil lead. Or artistry bolder than the cave sketches in red. Greater than any danger for we be a masterpiece of woman. 
You won't, can't change our brilliant different hues. That is a gallery you can't undo, but we can change you with our mission and our decision to disrupt that which is unjust with our say on all that rigid gray that obstructs us from being free. I tell you, I see women and girls drawing and writing the world they imagine, making it happen. There is no better disruptor than a woman using her culture to realize ruptures in those same structures that disgust her, in those structures that would disgust her but deduct her from the narrative. From the start, being a woman has meant being the imperative of an artist, an activist, a catalyst, the protagonist, in an epic story where together we help one another climb up the slick rings of a giant beanstalk ladder and shatter a glass ceiling above. We have always been enough. From the start, being a woman has meant being in part all this feeling, the hoping, the hustle, the healing. Being an ally to our sacred art means knowing it's not your part to see a woman and lead her but to see her as the leader, to follow her lead, to help her succeed so she can proceed to overcome that which would impede all of our progress. We are writing a new world between our notebook lines, painting new visions on March signs. We've always been the home front, a street intersection of creation and demonstration. In every brush stroke, in every word written and heard, we open up the floodgates for the shore, for the world waiting for the river to pour. Those is more than just validity in the creativity of women who rules out negativity to transform her reality. There was a stunning gravity in our riots of color, the unquiet warriors in a war we learned to win, and our choice is not to lift our swords, but our voices. We know it's more than the brushes function, it's about the art, it's more than the disruption, it's about the heart from the start. Being a woman means being a mixture of human and beauty that is too true to filter, a work of art too luminous to picture. Most of all, being a woman or a girl means creating a portrait together of a better world, one that leaves us in awe, one that is almost too bright to write and almost too blinding to draw. I see some hollows, okay. How are you guys feeling? Good? Nice. Okay. Awesome. Want to keep the energy going. Do, 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 do. I don't have time for two more poems. Man, the decision of what poem to read, it's like honor. Will they like me? Will they not? Will I fail? <laughs> I'm a very like intrinsic, like dramatic person, so that's just me. Um, I am going to take a risk and read this poem that I wrote as a coda to Black History Month with the New York Times. Um, and the reason that I like this poem is because I can't honestly say that it's mine. And the reason I say that is because I wrote this poem using only text from protest pins, flyers and kind of march posters collected from the 1960s that are available at the National Museum of like uh, African American History and Culture in DC, long title. Um, and basically how that process would work is I would go through the digital archives and say I found a pin in that archive that said like, Martin Luther King leads me. I can't take that text and like break it up and be like, leads me, King, Martin, like, no, I have to keep it that way. But I have to take that text and try to string it together into a collective poem that makes, I hope, sense. Um, let me drink some water, Lord. <laughs> Again, altitude, I'm like, wow, why do I feel like I'm exercising? Maybe I am. <laughs> So this poem is mine, but it's also not mine and that it's our collective because it's taken from text from history. <clears throat> Old Jim Crow got to go, whose face is white as snow. Everywhere Daisy goes, no dogs, no Negroes. I am a man. I am the way I am. I look the way I look. I am my age. I am a man, black power core, Malcolm X speaks for me, he died to make men free, Malcolm's legacy, one man, one vote, SNCC, don't you want to be free? 
I'm for King's Way, watch your backs, kill all blacks. When King out of Alabama cooking and smoking, where we at? Black males and endangered species. A perspective on solidarity. Black is beautiful, free. Angela Davis, now liberation in the making. Angela is free, free all political prisoners, 50% black women artists. Show it to Unbiased and unsought anatomy of the black aesthetic. In examination, Nikki Giovanni, poet, critic, go home, critic Harriet Tubman home. She allegedly has purchased several guns in the past, considered possibly armed and dangerous. Small scars on both knees, eyes, brown, race, Negro, nationality, American. What are girls made of? Catalyst for change, I believe, Anita Hale, age 26, height 5'8", hair black, occupation teacher. Women, free our sisters, what can a girl do? What have women done? What can you do? End racism and oppression. To testimony from a black sister marks the beginning of a new era in the minds, in the hearts, in the lives of all black men and women. Get it together. Together, march against slavery. We march with Selma. The moonwalk won't be as bad as our walk. Move on over or we'll move on over you. Lifting as we climb, we shall overcome. Freedom, ride, core, keep us flying, keep us flying. Don't you want to be free? Liberty and equality, they shall not die. Awesome. Um, I read that poem because, who? I also printed some of these poems, by the way, at my school, and they just mess everything up, as always. And so I'll be in the middle of poetry performance, I'm like, oh. Anyways, um, but I like that poem because it mentions a lot of the poets that inspire me personally um, and who have been important on my journey. Speaking of that, I'm going to read my last poem and so kind of be marinating in your head about maybe questions you have, comments, whatever. No question is dumb, no comment is unneeded, but don't do the whole, you know, assertion of my knowledge thing where I'm like, I'm going to speak about five minutes about all that I know and then I'm going to put a question mark at the end. Which I don't expect any of you guys to do because you've been a wonderful audience, but still. <laughs> there are those men who try to come up to me and tell me all that they know about poetry. Uh, and I'm like, oh, wow. I'm so interested. <laughs> um, really. Um, this one is a poem that I read um, at the Library of Congress as an introduction to Tracy K. Smith, who is an amazing, phenomenal writer. Um, and basically, it was in this moment in American history, it was like uh, fall of, what, oh my god, what year is it? Is it 2000? What year? It's 2018, okay. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> never mind. That's how my mind works. I'm literally still in 2012, and so I just like blink every now and then and remind myself we're actually in the now. But this was in fall of 2017. I mean, if you don't remember, there was just a lot of crazy stuff going on. Like, the earth kind of just threw up its hands, and it's like, I'm done. It was like hurricanes, wildfires in California, earthquakes, all sorts of things. But then we also had socio-political things happening in terms of DACA, in terms of Charlottesville, in terms of protests, in terms of hate crimes. And I knew I wanted to write a poem about America at that time and also about poetry, but it was just like every time I thought I was done with the draft, I was like, great, attach it to Gmail, send, bloop, done. Um, it was like something would happen the very next day and I had to integrate it into that. So this poem is kind of a mosaic of all those experiences that I think kind of swept the American conscious at the time. And my last note about this is as I'm reading it, I want you to imagine that you're standing with me at the Library of Congress, which is this building that is in DC. And interestingly enough, it sits between the Supreme Court Justice Building and also Capitol Hill. So I kind of see as the bridge of poetry between policy and justice. Um, so try to put yourself in that experience. In this place, an American lyric. There's a poem in this place in the footfalls, in the halls, in the quiet beats of the seats. It is here, at the curtain of day, where America writes a lyric you must whisper to say. 
There's a poem in this place in the heavy grace of this line building, collections burned and reborn twice. There's a poem in Boston's Copley Square where protest chants tear through the air like sheets of rain. Well, love of the many swallows hatred of the few. There's a poem in Charlottesville where tiki torches string a ring of flame tight around the wrist of night. Well, men so white they gleam blue seem like Confederate statues. Well, men heap that long wax burning ever higher where Heather higher blooms forever in a meadow of resistance. There's a poem in that great sleeping giant of Lake Michigan defiantly raising its big blue head to Milwaukee and Chicago. A poem begun long ago, blazed into frozen soil, strutting upward in the glow. There's a poem in Florida, in Puerto Rico, in East Texas, where streets swell into a nexus of rivers, cows afloat like mottled boys in the brown. Well, courage is now so common that 23-year-old Jesus Contreras rescues senior citizens from floodwaters. There's a poem in Los Angeles yawning wide as the Pacific tide where a single mother swelters in a windowless classroom teaching black and brown students in Watts to spell out the thoughts so her daughter might write this poem for you. There's a lyric in California where thousands of students march for blocks, undocumented and unafraid, where my friend Rosa finds the power to blossom and deadlock her spirit, the bedrock of her community. She knows hope is like a stubborn ship gripping a dock, a truth that you can't stop a dreamer or knock down a dream. How could this not be her city, su nacion, our country, our America, our American lyric to write to? A poem by the people, the poor, the Protestants, the Muslim, the Jew, the native, the immigrant, the black, the brown, the blind, the brave, the undocumented and undeterred, the woman, the man, the non-binary, the trans, the whites, the ally to all of the above and more. Tyrants fear the poet. Now that we know it, we can't blow it, we owe it to show it, not slow it, although it hurts to sow it when the world skirts below it, hope we must bestow it like a wick in the poet so it can grow lit, bringing with it new stories to rewrite. A story of a Puerto Rico depleted but not defeated, a history written that need not be repeated, a nation composed but not yet completed. There's a poem in this place, a poem in America, a poet in every American who rewrites this nation, who tells a story where they're being told on this minnow of an earth to breathe hope into a palimpsest of time, who sees that a poem penned doesn't mean a poem's end. There's a place where this poem dwells. It is here. It is now in the yellow song of dawn's bell where America writes a lyric we are just beginning to tell. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sure. <laughs> oh, you guys are awesome. Thank you. Oh, thank you, guys. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. That is exactly the way that I'd like to see it done. Thank you, everyone, for that. Yes. Amanda, thanks so much. We have some times for questions and answers. Um, we have someone here who will come to you with the mic. If you just raise your hand, if you have a question, we can commence. It's not working? Yeah, mine isn't either. Do I? See, hands raised. Yeah, I need this. Cool. I see so many hands raised already. I'm so happy. Oh, so look at all you guys. Wow. Are we, am I pointing, or do we have like a marathon runner who's <laughs> zipping between the lines? Just, she's checking on it. Sorry, one moment. <laughs> you can ask, if you, if you can project. Yeah, I saw hands right here. Hello, Woo! Hey! starting out with the philosophical questions. Um, I think there's a kind of... Ooh, I can project, it's fine. Um, I think there's two dimensions to that, and that 
I think there's a moment when you find the worth of your voice, but I think life is always a journey of finding your voice. There's never a destination because your voice is always changing. And maybe that comes from my perspective as someone who went from literally having a speech impediment to being, I don't even know how, a speaker for poetry in youth and her country. But all that to say, I can pinpoint a moment when I realized that it was important for my voice to be heard and for me to kind of love and cherish and value the ideas that I was bringing forward. And that kind of happened earlier on in elementary school when I looked on at kind of the books I was reading, the literature that was being presented to me, and I didn't see anybody that looked like me. I didn't see anyone that sounded like me or that came from my background. Um, and I realized that that had kind of influenced my own poetry. I was like, I was looking through my journals. I was like, Amanda, this is whack. Out of like the whatever, you know, short stories that you've written in your craze of a childhood where you're writing all the time, none of these characters that you've ever written have ever been black. None of them have ever been a black girl, and that's you. You know, you have a lot to bring forward in kind of that experience and that dimension. And so that was a moment for me where I realized, you know, if not me, who? If not now, when? Um, about the kind of the power of realizing the value of your voice, of joining into that type of community of writers and saying, this story, this narrative that has gone unseen and unheard can actually help us all if we kind of pause and listen to it a little bit. So that was kind of a moment for me. Hope that answers the question. Thank you guys for coming. I love that you guys are from that organization. Hey, awesome. Cool, we're walking up. Oh, and also tell me your name. I'd love to <laughs> know who you are. Do you ever use nature as an inspiration mm. for your poetry? Yeah, and let us know your name. Austin Maybe. Austin Maybe, awesome. Thank you so much for your wonderful question. I do use nature. Um, I had some that I printed out and I just happened not to read them today. Um, I love going down to, I'm from LA, so it sounds really bougie, but the ocean, <laughs> um, and riding, sorry. Um, and also we have a little Charles River that like runs beside Harvard, and I love riding there because there's a lot of inspiration from nature. But I do think there is this kind of difficult conflict inside of me. Um, the LA Poet Laureate at Robin Cost Lewis, who's a National Book Award winner, I was reading in an interview and she was like, if I could write poems about green apples, that would be great. And it's basically kind of that saying of, more often than not, when you're a writer and you're a woman or you're young or you're disabled or you're of color, there's kind of this pressure where it's like, nature is wonderful and I will write about it and you'll find it in my journal, but also I feel compelled to write also about issues that I feel affect all of us that aren't just about nature. I love writing about nature and the environment and why we should protect it, but also other issues such as equality, such as education, such as justice. Um, so I would like to say that my poetry tries to fuse all of those, to say that they're not separate, but they should be talked about. Hope that answers your question. Thanks. Hello, I'm Hello. Tammy. Tammy, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So your um, po poems, have you um, published them, or is there a place that we can go and you know, reread your words that are so powerful and maybe share them with our children yeah. or something <laughs> like that? So yeah. that's where I'm interested to see. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that question, Tammy. I'm like the worst self-promoter ever. Like I'll get to the end of the event, and my friend was like, shouldn't you mention like something about where they can find them. I'm like, oh yeah, I exist. Um, so you can really easily find my poetry if you look up like Amanda Gorman poetry, I hope. I hope I've gotten to that point on Google. That would be awesome. Um, and you can find a lot of the poems that I read today, like the Library of Congress one, uh, my New York Times pieces. I also have a book called The One for Whom Food is Not Enough, which you can order from my website, amandascgorman.com. And also I'm on social media as well and online, and that's really where I I try to put out my writing so it can be accessible. Um, I'm the daughter of like an English teacher, so I love being able to write something and exist outside of myself so that if a sixth grade teacher or whatever wants to share it in the classroom, like they can find it for free. They can share it with the students. So look at my name and hopefully you'll be able to have that accessibility experience. Thanks. <laughs> oh girl, I love your hair. Thank oh. you. <laughs> You gotta give people a warning before you stand up, just like letting you know. Sorry. Hi, oh Amanda. Hi. 
I, thank you. I'm Garme Matthew, I'm one of the coordinators for the Black Women Alliance here at CU Boulder, along with Sarah Woo! Gilliard and Emily Cornell in athletics. And basically, it's a space for Black women identified students on campus and from the undergraduate to faculty mm -hmm. and administration level. So we wanted to ask mm -hmm. you, what are some of the biggest obstacles that you've faced as a black woman in the arts? And um, how do you face being in spaces where mm -hmm. people would rather you homogenize mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. <laughs> content mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. more, um, I don't know how to say it, to be more reflective of people yeah. that don't look like you? Exactly. Wow, okay, that was not a low baller at all. You kind of warmed me up with the whole, I'm so gorgeous queen thing, and I was like, but serious question. Um, thank you so much, and I'm so glad there's an organization like that on this campus that kind of creates that type of space. To answer your questions, hopefully I don't forget the two. I think the one was like, you know, the obstacles I face as a black woman in the arts. I feel that like on one hand, there's like a lot of opportunities for people like me and we're seeing a lot of breakthroughs. For example, Carla Hayden is the first ever black woman um, librarian of Congress. We have Tracy K. Smith, who's the US Poet Laureate beside me. Um, and so we have kind of, I think a bit more representation than people like my mother, my grandmother would have had. But at the same time, as a black woman in poetry, you know, prejudice is consistent. <laughs> it's subtle, but it's consistent. In that um, from a young age, even when I was 12, whatever, when I first began trying to perform my poetry, I knew or I got the sensation that there were specific types of poetry that people expected me to do, that they expected me to only talk about specific issues, and that they only expected me to have a certain range of emotions in my art form. And what I mean by that is that a lot of people kind of expected me to be angry a lot in my poetry, which I'm not sure is the case, maybe you guys are like, she doesn't realize it, does she? But really, I try to bring, I think, a lot of joy about a lot of celebration, a lot of hope in that discussion of pain in my poetry. I think a lot of people solely expected me to kind of talk about race um, and not about other issues. And, you know, it's very clear in the emails that people send to me where they're like, you have a Black Lives Matter poem, right? And I'm like, Actually, like, would you send that email to someone who is a U.S. poet laureate who is not black? Like, I would hope they have a Black Lives Matter poem, too, because that would be awesome, but the expectation and the bar is set at a specific location for me. Um, and to answer your second question about, like, how I handle that and how I push back is um, making sure that I, how do I put this? I am aware of how those pressures exist, but that I keep historical examples in my head to kind of undercut that kind of monolithic expectation. What I mean by that is, for example, I was in a poetry class, and I was like the only black girl in it, and there were all these white guys who spoke a lot, and they were like, Amanda doesn't speak Greek. Ha! I was like, okay. Um, and, you know, there's these conversations that start to happen where people are like, oh, poetry that talks about social change you know, not nature, is not poetry. Poetry that talks about real political issues is not poetry, it's like propaganda. And I think that is a really dangerous kind of framework. And what I would say, oh, sorry guys, this, this gets me pumped. Whenever you hear someone kind of define poetry in that way, it's basically code for women and people of color do not belong here because that is the type of poetry that we're bringing forth. It's not the old, you know, people who were writing about a red wagon on a summer's day, which is great, I love that poetry too, it's great. Um, but you know, all the times it's the Tracy K. Smiths, it's the Nikki Giovannis, it's the Maya Angelou's, it's the Amanda Gomans, whatever, who are part of those conversations and by you saying, this is defensive poetry, you cannot come in. It's a way to kind of keep a supremacy on poetry. And what I do is I remind people very clearly and very respectfully about that dynamic and the kind of privileges and the context that we bring from that. And so I questioned the guy that said that, like, you know, your poetry is poetry. I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, um, well, you know, when has poetry really ever made social change? And I was like, 
I'm just like, ah. But he didn't know I was youth poet lawyer yet, yet, so that was great. And so I kind of, <laughs> I was just like, you don't even know what's about to happen. Like, you don't know what's about to hit you. But I'll start easy on you. What I'm going to do with you is I'm going to educate you with love. I'm going to talk to you about Martin Luther King's speech and the alliteration that he uses And I Have a Dream, talking about the content of his children's character, not the color of their skin, how that's alliteration helps infuse that line in the psychology of the nation. I'm going to talk to you about Audre Lorde. I'm going to talk to you about Sojourner Truth and her speech, Ain't I a Woman. I'm going to talk to you about the Declaration of Independence and the fact that the lawyers who wrote it were paid for every single word that they wrote. Thus, we see flowery, elegant, delicate, poetic language. And then, you know, I laid it easy for him, gave that out. He pushed it further. I was like, oh, shoot. And he was like... <laughs> You know, in this day and age, like young poets, like he's making change. And I was like, I don't know me. United States Youth Poet Laureate. And he was like, oh. And so anyways, as a roundabout answer to your question, you have to educate yourself on the history of poetry. You have to educate yourself on the ways on which you can educate other people. So you can really, I think, give them the historical content and the legacy of, you know, Maybe slaves were being persecuted for reading and writing during the antebellum South. That doesn't mean they weren't reading. It doesn't mean they weren't writing. It doesn't mean that they had their own forms and dialects of passing on poetry through the generations. And when you look at that historical tapestry, not only of the United States, but of the world, you realize, or you can help other people realize, that their expectations of poetry is actually limiting their own breath and their own imagination, what they can do. So hopefully that answers your question. I'm not sure. Cool. Thanks, guys. Today, take some poetry with you, and make sure you go online and find Amanda's, uh, Amanda's work. Share yes. it with your students. Share it with your family. Thank Thanks, you very guys. Much. Bye. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so. Much. Oh, let me take this off.